we have studied most of the technology pertaining to gene tech, where we looked at we combinant DNA technology, we talked about gel electrophoresis, PCR, microarrays, and also bioinformatics. So now that we have studied all those different types of technology, we have to understand how do we apply these particular technology into daily life. One application of gene tech is using genetic technology in medicine. And how do we use genetic technology in medicine? The first way we can do it is by using recombinant DNA technology in medicine. So remember, recombinant DNA technology just involves us taking out a gene normally from a human. We will put the gene into a vector. A vector can be plasmids, liposomes, or even viruses. And we put the vector and the gene into another species. What does that species do? That species will express the gene and produce the protein. Now, depending on the type of protein it produces, we can use those proteins uh, in medicine to treat diseases, to cure certain diseases, to manage sickness. So how do we do that? We need to know some specific examples of this. One example of using recombinant DNA technology in medicine is in the treatment of diabetes mellitus. Now, um, if you don't remember what diabetes mellitus is all about, it is just mainly there are two types of diabetes mellitus. There's type 1 and type 2. But uh, without going into the detail of it, a person who is diabetic is someone who might require insulin because perhaps their body is unable to produce insulin or they are not able to produce an adequate amount of that insulin hormone in their body. So to treat a person with diabetes, they require insulin. Now, before gene tech, it's a very important question to ask. If these people needed insulin, where did they get the insulin from? Before gene tech was a thing, we would normally get insulin, animal insulin, by the way, from dead cattle or pigs. Now, immediately you might see some problems if you get insulin from animals, but let's talk about this. So what they will do is when the uh, cattle or pigs die, they will remove the pancreas of these animals and extract as much insulin as possible out of these animals and they will inject those animal insulin into the diabetic person. So in this case, the diabetic patient receives animal insulin, whether it's pig or cow insulin. There are a few problems immediately that jumps out at you. The first problem is because the animals are dead, the amount of insulin you can get from them is very limited. That's the first problem. There is another problem. We have to consider ethical and religious considerations because um, from the ethical point of view, killing animals for food might be okay, but is it a good thing to just kill animals because we want to take their insulin from them. That's another ethical conundrum that people might be dealing with. On the religious aspect of things, if a person is Hindu, they may not accept insulin from the cows, or if the person is Muslim, they may not accept insulin from pigs. In those situations, that might be uh, a thing that goes against the person's religious beliefs, right? And thirdly, also, immune responses may occur. Now, if you remember, uh, immune response, what is immune response, by the way? In chapter 11 of immunity, we, I told you that immune response is just what happens when your lymphocytes will attack something that is foreign. Now, human insulin has a specific shape, which I'm representing in the perfect triangle. So when the B lymphocyte looks at the human insulin, it will identify that as, oh, you belong to a part of me. You are the self, so I will not attack you. But animal insulin, because they have different base sequences in their genes, so when they produce the insulin, yes, it is insulin, but the 3D structure of the insulin will be different because they have different amino acid sequences in the protein. So in that case, the animal insulin will have a slightly different shape. And if it goes into our body, our lymphocytes may identify them as non-self. And if it identifies it as non-self, what will happen? Our lymphocytes will attack it. Now, is it a big thing? Is it a big deal if it attacks it? Well, yeah, it is. Because number one, it can cause allergic reactions in your body. Number two, also, if they destroy the animal insulin, the insulin is not able to work in the person. It's just a waste 
uh, when you injected the insulin into your body because it, it will eventually get destroyed by our immune system. So what's the point? So in that case, to solve these particular problems that we are having, we would use gene tech. And in particular, we use recombinant DNA technology. If you remember in the previous videos, we talked about recombinant DNA technology in a few videos. We take the insulin gene out of the person. We put it into a plasmid to make it into a recombinant plasmid. We will then put the recombinant plasmid back into the bacterium. And guess what? The bacterium is now able to produce human insulin. So it is a bacteria, but it's producing human insulin for us. So in this case, we can take those insulin and inject those insulin into the person. So the diabetic patient receives human insulin in this case. What's the advantage? The advantage is we can mass produce this insulin very easily. And because it's mass produced, it will eventually lower the cost as well because Tech, when mass production happens, one of the goal of mass production is to minimize cost, all right? So that's a good thing. Of course, you can argue that in some countries, the price of insulin is skyrocketing, especially in the United States. In some states, uh, it can be quite confusing. But under normal circumstances, if the healthcare system is... Uh, for the most part, they care about the people. Uh, <laughs> it is in their best interest to keep the price of insulin low. So that's a good thing. Uh, there's also less ethical and religious issues because this insulin did not come from the cattle or pigs. It came from a bacterium. So there's less ethical issues pertaining to bacteria. And that's fine. So, and the third more important thing is, what about the immune response then? In the immune response, human, if the insulin was obtained from the bacterium, the bacterium still produced human insulin right? So in that situation, it's fine because the B lymphocyte will look at that insulin injected and even though it's produced by the bacterium, it still looks like a human insulin because it came, the gene came from the human anyway. So the B lymphocyte will not attack the insulin that is injected into the person. Therefore, there won't be any immune response. So that's a good thing. Now, Using recombinant DNA technology as well in medicine, we can treat a disease known as hemophilia. And I'm going to put a link on the top right corner as a reminder to what hemophilia is. It is a blood clotting disorder. Yeah? So you need to know what is hemophilia. So please click that link on the top right corner as a reminder. Now, before gene tech, all right, the person with hemophilia needs a protein and that particular protein is called factor eight protein. Now, before gene tech was a thing, where do these people who are hemophiliacs, uh, where do they get factor eight proteins? They would usually get factor eight proteins from blood donors. So the donor donates the blood, obviously, and the blood is then transfused because the blood will contain factor eight from the healthy person. It will be transfused into the hemophiliac. So the hemophiliac in this case receives factor eight and blood through blood transfusion. So the problem here, there are some problems. There's limited blood supply because not everybody can donate blood or would, are willing to donate blood. Number two, the donor and the recipient must have compatible blood type. You don't need to know this in detail, but then a person with blood type A can only donate to A and AB, B can only donate to B and AB, AB can only donate to AB, and O can donate to everyone. So the recipient or the person who is hemophiliac, we would have to consider the source of the blood as well because if the blood is incompatible you cannot give the blood to the person who has hemophilia because it may cause immune response to happen we don't want that to happen and thirdly there are also risk of pathogen transmissions for example hiv can spread through blood transfusion if they are not careful certain diseases like maybe malaria would also be able to be transmitted as well so it comes with a lot of problems too because the person needs factor eight proteins they receive it from the blood of another person but there are issues pertaining to it so what do we do in this case again we use recombinant dna technology from the healthy human we will extract the normal f8 gene which codes for factor eight protein we will put it into a vector you don't need to know the name of the vector and it's inserted into a hamster cell or any 
suitable eukaryotic animal cells. Now, some students will ask me the question, just like the insulin gene, which we put into a plasmid, which was inserted into the bacterium, why can't we do that? Why do we have to use a hamster cell or the eukaryotic animal cell in this case? There are many reasons, but one of the main reason is factor 8 protein is a very special type of protein that may need to be modified using the Golgi body. And bacteria do not have Golgi bodies, so they may not be able to produce factor 8 or modify the factor 8 to the degree that we want it. So that is why we would prefer to use a eukaryotic animal cell because they have Golgi body and they sort of behave like human cells. So that's why we use hamster cells. One of my students is like, oh my God, do we kill hamsters? I'm like, mm, yeah, we kind of do. Anyway, let's just uh, move past that sad fact um, and just continue on. Uh, in this case here, what happens is the genetically modified hamster cell will then produce factor 8 protein and we just take that factor 8 protein and inject it into the hemophiliac. So the hemophiliac receives factor 8 protein produced through the recombinant DNA technology. What's the advantage? We don't have to care about limited blood supply because we are not getting it from blood. We are getting it from the hamster cells. So it can be mass produced easily. Do we have to worry about compatible blood types? No, we don't have to. So there's no immune response. And because we are not using blood, there are no risk of pathogen transmission at all. So this is why recombinant DNA technology solves a lot of problems that existed before gene tech. The final treatment using recombinant DNA technology is the treatment of severe combined immune deficiency in infants usually. Now you don't have to go through this in detail, SCID, you can just call it SCID in the exam. Now, people with SCID will have a mutation of the ADA gene. Uh, don't have to, again, I'm just gonna explain that. Now, because they have a mutation of the ADA gene, they are unable to produce a particular enzyme known as adenosine deaminase. I don't think you need to memorize this, but I think you should just know that it is unable to produce an important enzyme. And because we are not able to produce that important enzyme, it causes destruction of T lymphocytes in the person, which leads to severe combined immune deficiency problems. And these kind of people, their immune system is so weak, they might have to live in those, perpetually live in those bubbles. I'm sure you've seen those uh, uh, pictures of kids living in bubbles uh, where they have to be isolated from the world because any pathogen that goes into the body may kill them easily. So to treat this disease, now before gene tech was a thing, the infant who needed that enzyme, because they are not able to produce that enzyme, adenosine deaminase, uh, where do we get those enzymes from before gene tech? We would get it from dead cattle usually. And again, Injecting the dead cattle enzymes into the infant would have problems. The amount of enzyme is limited. There's ethical and religious considerations. As I've mentioned earlier, using animal products and immune response because it came from animals, it may be considered foreign by our lymphocytes and, you know, the lymphocytes may destroy the enzyme. <clears throat> Not that they have many lymphocytes to begin with, but, you know, immune response may still occur. So the next thing is, so what's the solution to this problem? We would use gene tech. So we would take the ADA gene from a healthy person, put it into a recombinant plasmid, and we can put this into the bacterium. And guess what? The bacterium produces human adenosine deaminase as opposed to cow adenosine deaminase. We can take that adenosine deaminase and we can inject it into the baby or the infant. So why is this a good thing? I'm just going to adjust the place a little bit, my notes. It's good. What are the advantages? Again, the same thing. It can be mass produced. It has a lower cost. There's less ethical and religious issues. And because the infant is receiving human adenosine deaminase, there won't be any immune response. So in this case, these are some of the ways we can use recombinant DNA technology in medicine to treat diabetes mellitus, hemophilia, and also SCID. These are the three diseases that you have to know when it comes to your paper four of Cambridge A-levels.